Talk to me about the the children involved in this story. And when you're talking with them about this horrific crime, what what was your lives like early on? Were, was it normal or, or were things always bizarre? You mean with Diane and Stephen? Yes. Oh, uh, uh, Diane is my source. Stephen is her brother. Stephen's mm-hmm. three years older than Diane. All right. And our story in the book begins when Diane is six years old and her father and mother uh, take her and Stephen down to the uh, uh, the base to an office where they you know they live on base take them down there and sign them up for a special program that is where our our book begins now in real life we have a story that goes back generations and it, just to not dwell on this too much, but Diane comes from a family that has uh, shamanistic tendencies on both sides. Uh, on her father's side, one of the uh, uh, great grand uh, dams was a shaman in Siberia, a Siberian shaman, and was there when uh, the Tunguska event it happened in 1918 and a meteor wiped out her village and she was blinded and she had to walk and find her way to civilization after that. She had to live with reindeer. and uh, So that came down in Diane's family and uh, a lot of the abilities that come with that uh, would be in her genetics. On her mother's side, they were Lenny Lad, Le, I'm sorry, <coughs> Lenny Lenape or Delaware Indians. And uh, great grandfather's grandmother was a, uh, a shaman in, uh, in that persuasion. Uh, so coming down through there, there was shape shifting, there was uh, different uh, levels of reality involved. Now we come to Dad. Dad was born in 1912 in America, in Boston, to uh, the uh, La- uh, Lithuanian parents, and then uh, was only here for three months, and then the mother took him back to Lithuania where he grew up. When he became 17, it was 1929, and he had to come back to America to keep his citizenship. This is 1929, and he was in Lithuania. So he set out on foot to find his way across Europe to come to America. He had an aunt, Magda, who was sending him money. But for him to get where he had to go, he had to walk. Walking through Poland or Germany, he came to a concentration camp. And he approached the camp and was socializing with a girl on the other side of the fence when the the guards came and caught him. They gave him a choice which side of the fence he wanted to be on. And the people inside the fence were prisoners and outside were the guards, and he chose to stay with the guards. So from then on, he was a collaborator with the Nazis. This is before he was 17. He he would tell these stories to his wife while the children would just have to, uh, you know, eavesdrop. This is how Diane learned these things. He told of of the time when they lined up a bunch of prisoners and made them dig their own pit, stood them up in front of the pit and shot them all, but they weren't all dead. And the commander said he didn't want to waste any more bullets, so he gave... Sylvestris a knife and told him to slit the throats of the dying in the pits. And when he was done, he was covered with blood, and he told his wife, he said, I prayed if there was a God that I wouldn't wake up in the morning. And then when he did wake up, he said he knew there was no God. How horrific. So bringing this kind of a background, he came to the United States and went to New York and became a butcher. And uh, then he went to work for the uh, uh, CCC, which was Civilian Conservation Corps, which started in 1933. He went in the Army for two years, did a uh, stretch, 
and got out. Now, it was 1939 when he went back in the Army the second time, and at this point, they said he had to change his name. His Lithuanian name was Silvestris Greekshaw. At the time he re-enlisted in 1939, they said it had to be Stephen Griggs. He changed and uh, went to work in the Army as a cook and married mom. And wh- why was the name change so important? Well, he needed to be more American now. Okay. Uh, and uh, to, you know, flash forward about a million years uh, and debriefing after he was dead and everything with the uh, FBI people, it was revealed to Diane and Stephen that he had a very complicated uh, uh, dossier uh, suitable for a double agent with his uh, dual citizenship. So that is his deep background, and that places him there in the army. Uh, our story, when our, our our story begins, uh, Diane is six. They're living in Fort Devens, and this starts to take a very bizarre twist. And I mean, when we talk about bizarre, they, you, you start to hear the story, and you're you're reading through these notes and and hearing from her directly. At any point, do you just say there's this just cannot be true? This there's no way this kind of depravity and weirdness so could be real. So hold that hold that thought, Dave, okay, and and focus on that. And imagine being treated that way. And that's what I call the true horror of this story. We have to take a break, and we'll come back after the top of the hour. We have a whole nother hour with our guest, Good Little Soldiers, a memoir of true horror.